Yes, tech infrastructure needs to scale, so does our community. I'm Wang Xingchen from Binance Marketing Team, and I'm happy to announce one of our favorite awards, the Binance Angel of the Year. Our amazing angel volunteers are pillars of the Binance community. In honor of our 200 angels in 50 different countries, we are given away five awards for the best performing angels for each specialty. Okay, without further ado, let's see the result. So the winners will be selected based on the angel peer vote in the Binance team votes. And here's our first award for a community guardian. This is our most competitive award because most of our angels are focused on this specialty. And congratulations to the nominees. Making to this list is already quite difficult. Congrats. And let's see who's the winner here. Rivka, congratulations. Rivka is always in our community, and she is so kind and patient in helping all the users with questions. You definitely deserve this. Hello everyone, I'm Rivka, the Binance Angel from the Netherlands, helping many communities of Binance. I would like to thank especially He Yi and CC for being an inspiration for me during this journey. Thank you to the employees and angels who voted for me to get this first ever given award to an angel. It's much appreciated and last but not least, I would like to thank the Binance community for always being around. Thanks everyone for being a part of this journey together. To the Binance angels worldwide, I would wanted to send you a message of appreciation for working hard to make Binance community successful. It's so cool to see the communities growing and you are making it happen. Thanks everyone. And here comes our second award for a PR and a KOL pilot. And the nominees needs to have pretty good network and a good, good relationship building. And the winner goes to... Tony, congratulations to Tony. He's our UK angel, been with us for more than a year. And he's always helpful in all different friends. Thanks, Tony. Hi everyone, my name is Tony Chufi. I'm one of the Binance Angels based here in UK. I'm delighted to accept this Angel of the Year Winners Award. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone that voted for me. In particular, I would like to give special thanks to Hei and CZ for inspiring us. To my Binance colleagues, your continued support is much appreciated. And to my fellow angels, I say, keep up the great work. Let our soul exchange the world one conversation at a time. Finally, Binance, happy third year anniversary. And to everyone that is watching this live stream, enjoy the show. Many thanks and see you all soon. Bye bye. And here comes our third award for Content Master. For this one, the nominee needs to be both hardworking at the same time with a talent of skills. And let's see who is going to be the winner. Jorge, congratulations. Jorge is very hardworking and he produces a lot of content for us, especially in Espanol. We appreciate you, Jorge. Hey, I just want to say that I am very happy to receive this award because it means a lot to me. Binance is my second home and together we are building something great. The Angels family grows and every day we stay more closer and stronger. So thank you so much for this. Thanks, Jorge. And here's our fourth award for Events Master. This one requires a dedication to details and relentless execution. And who's going to be the winner? Mire, congratulations to our Latin angel. Mire is also super passionate and helpful, you know, now helping us doing a lot of the webinars. Thanks, Mire. Hello, greetings from Medellin, Colombia. It's a pleasure for, for me to be part of Binance family and speak to my Latin American communities about freedom of money. 
uh, Angel program is really fantastic. Um, you can teach and learn and meet people around the world. It's the best experience in my life. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm really happy. And the final one, Tech Warrior. This one requires a deep understanding of our product and also able to answer technicality related questions. And who's going to be the final winner? Richie, congratulations. Richie is especially helpful in our finance DAX community because DAX is so technical. Um, Richie is the one that's always there to provide answers. Hello Thanks, folks, Richie. this is Richie, Binance Angel. I want to thank everybody for their support. I'm very happy to receive this award. I want to thank the team, the angels, and each one of you who made this possible. Thank you. Love you all. Stay safe. And let's hope for the best in the years to come. Take care. Bye. Congrats to all the winners. And we love all our angels in our family. So um, it's time for us to say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed the panels within this segment. And I would like to thank all of our speakers. Yeah, thank you for being with us, everyone. And stay for more panels from other parts of the world. And please welcome the Binance folks in North America and Latin America, Leah and Myra. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Gleb and Anna. Uh, it's, um, hi, everyone. My name is Leah Lee, and thank you so much for joining us at the Binance Turn 3 Off the Charts Conference. I will be co-hosting the last segment of our 10-hour long program focusing on North America and Latin America. Please also welcome my lovely co-host, Myra. Hello everyone, I'm Mayra Siqueira from Brazil and it's amazing we've seen Binance doing in those three years to come here today with such a strong presence in all America. So thank you for your constant support and for keeping us on helping us on spreading freedom of money to such a diverse community. I'm thrilled to be part of it. Likewise. The community is super strong when it comes to crypto and it's really incredible to see what we can accomplish together. So as we celebrate our Binance's three-year anniversary today, especially, we really want to thank all of our users and everyone in the community for all of your support and your feedback over the years um, and how you've been able to help us get to where we are today. Yeah, that's so true. And we love hearing your feedbacks, hearing your suggestions, ideas, so we can keep on building. It's our pleasure also to present our final lineup of panels and fireside chats to wrap up this major event. So in this segment, you can look forward to quite a few topics that I'm personally pretty excited about as well. Um, definitely stay tuned and we'll be discussing the regulatory environment when it comes to crypto. Um, and blockchain. Uh, we will also talk about scalability and blockchain development, security, and how to keep your crypto assets secure. And also, of course, how the COVID-19 pandemic is shaping and accelerating the adoption of crypto worldwide. And also pay attention that we have two stages. So we have the global stage and also the local stage. And in the local stage, we're going to bring now, uh, from now on, uh, two localized contents with stunning case of crypto study case in Venezuela, which is really interesting. So this is going to be a Spanish session for all the hablantes de español. And also we're going to have a panel fully dedicated to innovation and financial services in Brazil. So it's going to be in Portuguese, ou seja, in Portuguese para vocês. So let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy it. In this segment, we will also be announcing a few more winners and awards. Um, really loved hearing about all of the angels that won awards, so congratulations to all the angels. Um, in this segment, we will announce the final influencer awards, so we will have uh, influencer for North America, for Latin America, as well as for 
for Global. So please stay with us until the very end and we'll also have a special happy birthday for Binance's three years. And also remember, we still have one more NFT giveaway during this event. So stay with us until the end of the program for a chance to win this limited edition prize. So let's kick off the program with our next keynotes and panels. Could you introduce them, Leah? Yep. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Carrie Ann Boring of the Chamber of Digital Commerce and Tina Baker Taylor from Binance for a conversation on crypto's evolving regulatory environment. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Tina Baker Taylor, Binance's UK Director, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Perry Ann Boring, founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Hey, Perry Ann, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Tina, thanks for having me. I'm so glad to be here. It's a pleasure. We're glad you're here. Um, so for our viewers who may not know you um, or may not know you well, we'd like to find out a little bit more about you and, and your journey um, toward founding the Chamber. So prior, you began your career as the legislative analyst in the U.S. House of Representatives. And I think you were advising on finance, economics, tax, and, and healthcare policy, so a number of things. Um, is that when you became interested in the crypto space and um, what did you find most interesting about crypto? Yeah, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background on how I got here and, and how I made my way to Washington, D.C., um, I was studying economics at the University of Florida during the 2008 financial crisis. And the mm -hmm. financial crisis was... The, the real estate market and the real estate issues were in Florida and pretty much everybody I knew was impacted by this, uh, th this crisis. So mm -hmm. I, I, as a student of economics, really challenged myself to just understand what the heck was going on between Washington and Wall Street and why that was impacting my family and my community and everybody I knew. And what came out of that was, uh, I was quite, quite disturbed <laughs> at uh, mm. the state of our economic affairs and how we got there and felt we should have better accountability. And I dedicated my career to working in public policy and moved to DC to fight for a better economic future for my generation and those that will come after me. So in working on Capitol Hill, I learned about Bitcoin. And as a, a, an economist, you know, looking at this virtual currency that was not controlled or created by a government or a corporation or a group of people, mm -hmm. that was just a fascinating concept. And the more I learned about Bitcoin and the more I learned about blockchain technology, the more I felt that all of the things that I was fighting for from a policy perspective, from a more transparent financial system to a more safe and secure and efficient way to remit payment globally, I felt that Bitcoin represented all of those things. And I just became a huge advocate. And, and I feel this is the most important technology I will ever see in my entire life. And I've done dedicated my entire focus on helping support the growth of this technology. So that's when we founded the Chamber of Digital Commerce and um, our, our space and what we, we're, we're, we're trying to contribute to this industry is to be a, a reputable resource based in our nation's capital that can work with policymakers and help just answer all the questions that they have. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of skepticism and the weird things about Bitcoin and crypto and blockchain. We wanna educate them, we wanna make sure they have the right information and we wanna make sure our voice is heard in conversations that are gonna impact the growth of our ecosystem. So that's what we set out to do and we've been pretty busy ever since. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have. So, um... Since its inception, you know, crypto, that's a great story, a flip story. I don't think um, a lot of people hear, I was on the hill and I learned about Bitcoin in the same sentence. So that's, I think, a little unusual. And also, I think I'm struck by every time I talk to founders who just drip with excitement about what they're doing, it's usually because they're addressing a problem that they experience themselves. So it's very personal. Um, and it sounds like your story started there from a very personal experience of something that you wanted to prevent from happening again. Yeah, I mean, so, um, it's a deal. I really believe in it. And I've, uh, this is what I'm spending my, my, my time on. And it's, it's how I want to help make the world a better place. And um, there's really nothing else like being able to, con to, to do what you love and, and make that also your career. So I, I feel very, very honored, but fortunate to get to do you know, what we do today. Yeah, huge. So um, since 2008, when the crypto 
uh, seeing kind of exploded onto the world. There's been many ups and downs. You know, we've experienced some great challenges, but also some exponential growth along the way. Um, and, you know, the industry continues to grow. And yet we still have some regulatory uncertainty. So, you know, after establishing the, the chamber, um, now actually six years ago, almost to the day, you're celebrating your sixth birthday wow. soon. So congratulations, six years strong. Um, what has been um, the, the most surprising um, part of your six year journey? So you kind of described, you know, what you set out to do along the way, what surprised you most? So one of the things that's been really interesting is seeing the, the, the Federal Reserve's response to cryptocurrencies. The very first, I mean, at the beginning of, of Bitcoin and the crypto ecosystem, a lot of people were really interested in what is the Fed's response going to be to this new, mm -hmm. new currency? And the Fed didn't say a word until 2013. 2013, when Janet Yellen yeah, was testifying in her semi-annual address to Congress, and uh, Senator Joe Manchin had asked Janet Yellen, the chair of the Fed, if, sh if she could ban Bitcoin, because he was adamantly against it because of all the illicit, that was right during uh, Silk Road, so people using Bitcoin for illicit purposes, he thought it should be shut down, can the Fed do that? And her response was, the Fed has no jurisdiction over Bitcoin. And like, that was it. And like, she just moved on to the next question. And like, that was all we heard from, mm -hmm. you know, arguably one of the most powerful institutions. And it really didn't give us much insight at all in their thinking. And fast forward to today. So now, just a few years later, it hasn't really been, I mean, it seemed in Bitcoin time, it seems like a long time, but in just a few, few short years, the new chair of the Fed, Jay Powell, just last year was asked about Bitcoin in his semi-annual address to Congress. And he said, it's like digital gold. So a store of value is you know, one, of, one of the key use cases of Bitcoin. And to have the chair of the Fed validate that this technology is, is used for that purpose, I thought was probably one of the most important endorsements it could ever get. So just to see that huge change in their thinking in a short amount of time has been really amazing to, to see and, and really shows the, the true importance uh, of what this technology is and, and, and what it has the potential to become. I think what it also shows, uh, Perianne, is the true importance of working with and educating and being committed to influencing some of these influencers. Um, and, you know, the chamber by this point had spent, you know, three at least years working with these, these uh, policymakers to try and, and change that early perception that you talked about. So that, that's a big leap from, you know, let's ban it to, you know, it's digital gold. Um, so the chamber itself, its members consist of a number of big firms, right? So big uh, players in the innovation space, IBM, Cisco, Microsoft, NASDAQ, Block, to name a few, Block One. Um, so is it important to have these big companies uh, use their gravitas and their weight to influence policymakers? And if yes, then where does that leave the smaller companies and how can they get involved? Yeah, so, so two points there. As someone who worked on Capitol Hill on financial services issues, my job was to meet with all the trade groups and the lobbyists and the special interest groups and all the issues Congress is, is, is uh, deliberating on. And mm -hmm. the incumbents, you know, the banks, your established financial services companies, they have just unbelievable amounts of resources in, mm -hmm. in these policy conversations. And um, I, I always felt that it is important that we engage them in the process because their voice is so big and so powerful to just ignore that would be naive and a huge misstep. So mm -hmm. by creating an inclusive platform, and so for me, I've always wanted the chamber and everything that I do in this space to be as inclusive as possible. Mm -hmm. We welcome all those in our platform that share our values, depending, you know, you, Many different companies are using uh, and, and innovating in many different ways. And all of those who are dedicated to growing this ecosystem and developing this technology, please be a part of these important policy conversations that we're having. Yeah. 
but we are really unique and that I think we probably are, you know, one of the only groups in this space that has brought together the technology companies and the incumbents into one platform. And to be able to get consensus amongst that group on the policy positions impacting crypto, that is a huge feat, but it also gives us an unbelievably powerful voice as we're advocating for the growth of this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you do raise a good point. So if you have really big companies, like public companies, and you have really small companies, like small startups, they don't have the same amount of resources to contribute yeah. to public policy things. And I, I certainly understand that. Every single, we represent over 200 companies. Every single company has the same voice. Uh, larger companies do pay larger membership dues because uh, they should. Yeah. But every company has an equal voice. And our default position when we when we um, create a policy position and we go to the Hill or we go to you know, Congress or the agencies and we're, we're advocating for that is always going to be what's best for the ecosystem as a whole. Not what's best for this member or that member or this group or that group. We are advocating for the growth of the entire ecosystem. So that's where, where our position is always going to default to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes not everybody agrees on that because it can disenfranchise one company over another. Um, but uh, we wanna do the right thing. We wanna have an inclusive platform and we're always going to promote the growth of this ecosystem over the growth of one particular company who may or may not have more resources than another. So all, all are encouraged and welcome to participate and uh, we ensure that what, what we do um, is in line with that mission. So what, what is the upside for the industry? I, I've talked a lot about, you know, engaging as well um, and how to do that and how to be effective in doing that, no matter what the size of your business is. And, you know, there will, there will always be, you know, those members of the community that, you know, have a different ideological view around the involvement that policymakers and governments, et cetera, should or do have today um, in this technology. So what is in it for the industry? What is the upside for participating in these policy discussions? These conversations are happening whether you wanna be a part of them or not. I mean, the most powerful offices in the world today are debating and writing regulations and, and uh, that are going to dictate the future of this ecosystem. So you have a choice. You can either be a part of the conversation and try to shape it in a direction that's going to be beneficial, or you can have it shaped around you. And I can guarantee you that the, the former is going to end up in a better position than the latter. And also for younger companies, for startups, for um, smaller organizations, being a part of a, a trade group like the Chamber where you can share resources with other companies is a great way to have your voice heard without having to bring in your own team of public policy experts. So there's a lot of resources you can share off of the Chamber's platform to ensure you have a meaningful voice, but doing it in a way that makes sense for a small company. So from this quite privileged position that the chamber, you know, privilege is maybe not the right word. I think you guys have earned the position that you're in to be at the table and influencing some of these discussions. What are you hearing from governments and policymakers about, you know, how do they go about formulating some of these rules and regulations? What are the considerations that they're, that they're evaluating? Yeah, and one of the other things that I wanted to just mention, we, we also operate on, on a form of, of radical transparency. So all of our members are posted on our website. So anyone and everybody wants to know exactly who uh, is part of the, 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 the Chamber's platform. And also all of our policy positions are all posted on our website. So every single letter we've ever submitted to a government organization, we put it online. So if you want to learn more about exactly what our positions are and and exactly what we're saying to government, we want everyone to be able to, to share in that, that, that knowledge and have access to that in the spirit of, of transparency. Um, in terms of uh, what some of the issues are, uh, it's kind of interesting. So uh, I'll just focus on the US. And in the US, we have this two party system, you know, with Republicans and Democrats, and both sides kind of care about two very different things. Republicans, I'm um, 
really seem to be very sympathetic to the business arguments that this is an incredibly important technology. We want the United States to be at the, the, the lead of developing and in, 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 in the innovation of this technology. We want U.S. companies to be leaders in the blockchain ecosystem, and we want to give them the regulatory clarity and certainty they need to be able to establish businesses and grow and create jobs and create economic prosperity here in the United States. Republicans seem to be um, I, you know, more sympathetic to, to, to that conversation and have been quite active in uh, helping us get there on a number of specific policy issues, whether it's AML issues or tax issues, you're dealing with the Securities and Exchange Commission or so on and so forth. On the Democrat side, it's very it's very different types of conversations. So they have uh, concerns about investor protections and consumer protections. Uh, you know, Bitcoin has been a highly volatile asset over the past uh, well since its inception, and we've seen you know huge um, price spikes during a a bull market, and then a lot of of of. Uh, wealth being you know, evaporated through the, 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 the cycles. And yeah. there's natural concerns there, but that's also the ebb and flow of crypto. So they're very, you know, very much in, in tune with ensuring that, yes, of course, the United States is a, is a leader in this technology, but that we're also creating appropriate protections um, to ensure we have a healthy functioning marketplace. So th there is a balance and there are um, legitimate concerns that need to be addressed. And getting there has always been, uh, you know, an ongoing conversation. Yeah. So, you know, and I think we see history repeat itself kind of time and again, right? And when it comes to these um, big, you know, wholesale technological advancements and innovations, regulatory uncertainty kind of seems to follow. It just comes hand in hand with that. Um, what do you think we have or can learn from lessons from the past that we can um, put into practice today to kind of ease some of that transition um, into um, you know, global acceptance and the mainstreaming of blockchain technologies and, and crypto assets that go along with them? So education is the biggest challenge in having these policy conversations. Mm -hmm. And learning about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology is something that takes more than like a 15 minute briefing. <laughs> I mean, usually when you meet with, you know, a member of Congress or, a, you know, a, a regulatory official, they're pretty quick meetings. They're used to like coming in, you have a quick ask, you deliver like a one page yeah. or with a summary, but it's, it's been hard to do that if nobody really knows what it, it is you're talking about. So first we have yep. to inspire these people to want to understand this technology. And then once they have a basic degree of education, then we can start talking about the policy issues. So continuing to refine the messaging and making the learning process easier. I mean, when I first learned about Bitcoin, I probably spent an entire year just reading mm -hmm. all sorts of whatever I could find on the internet. And it, it took me quite a bit of time just to understand how it works, let alone how the policy implications are going to impact this technology. So, Well, and imagine all the information that you had at your disposal or you yeah, had nothing. access to yeah. that <laughs> versus the amount of information that yeah. exists today. You can comment right? on, like, it's exponential. on Reddit and like YouTube videos of, of founders and tech pioneers. So you know, refining those the, the, the messaging, refining the educational process is key. And something that I really believe in is actually letting people touch the technology, like letting them send and receive a crypto transaction, letting them see how it works. And that's always really tricky because you can't really give a government official something of money. So you've got to figure out a way to create a demo, but still let them you know, interact with it. Uh, no. So those are some of the things we're working on. I remember um, uh, working with a policymaker trying to explain custody and how cold storage wasn't like a safe deposit box, but it kind of was. It is, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so we kind of got all the way through that in, in, in maybe 45 minutes later, we're, we're a bit on the same page. And then somebody says, um, well, what's MPC? And I thought, oh, no. And, you know, the whole idea that on top of the thing they just learned, now there's all these additional layers of things where, you know, it's already evolved into something else. So there's already um, permutations of what I just explained to you. 
And I, I remember the look on their face and I just thought, okay, that is for another day because you, you literally just only go so both. far in one, one setting. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to MPC. Um, so um, I can imagine that over the last six years and, and probably a couple of years prior while you were having your flipping, that there have been some pretty interesting moments in crypto for you. Um, I get the impression that you've seen and heard a lot of things. So I'd like to ask you what your most memorable moment um, from your time in crypto has been. So my most memorable moment would have been the day we announced the formation of the chamber, which we, we, we launched on July 19th of 2014. So just about six years ago. And uh, we, ha we uh, did it at the North American Bitcoin conference. It was in an industry event in Chicago and uh, Mo Levin, who organized the event, he uh, allowed me to make a special announcement at the very start. Uh, of the event. So, so I'm in there and nobody really knows what I'm about to say. And probably nobody really knows me either. And uh, I, I, I get up and I just said, look, we're, we're launching the Chamber of Digital Commerce. It, it's launched today. Uh, you know, all are welcome to be a part of this. We, we are here to serve as a resource to policymakers and, and to address all of these regulatory challenges that we have as a community. And this is 2014. So the community looked very different then than it does. It, it did today. There was no one in DC working on crypto stuff at all. Mm -hmm. We were the first mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the people were like cyberpunks, you know, mm -hmm. anarcho capitalist, like the, the whole narrative of Bitcoin was like, we're going to overthrow the government. We're going to overthrow the banks. Mm -hmm. And like Bitcoin's going to change, like, ch like this, it was a really different space. So I'm like, either these people are going to like bulldoze me and it, maybe assassinate me. I don't know. I was so nervous. I really did not know how people would respond. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise, everyone would like cheered, stood and clapped. Like people were like, this is a great idea. So it was the, probably the most relieving moment of my life because <laughs> I wasn't sure how folks were going to take it, but it has been amazing that there are a lot of people that do understand we have to engage on the policy. As much as we're investing on building out the tech and building out our teams and our communities and our platforms, you also have to invest in those policy issues because if you don't get those right, it's going to put huge roadblocks. So yeah. it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's been a total whirlwind. <laughs> it's a great story. Um, so we're coming up to time um, for to 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 round us, round us up. Um, what advice would you give for entrepreneurs and startups entering the space? Um, what's kind of what's what's next for them? What's next for us? Yeah. So two two, two quick things. One is keep going. It's hard to, and to start any type of company, but we are in such a, uh, a challenging space, you know, building networks, building crypto networks that creates a lot of time. It creates, it, it takes a huge amount of dedication, but know what you're doing is changing the world for the better. And despite whatever roadblocks are thrown your way, keep going. And if you need a word of encouragement, call me anytime. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to be, you know, your, your supporter and advocate in that journey you know, as I've had to do with, with building the chamber as a nonprofit. And the second is be kind to each other. There's a lot of competition in this space, but at the end of the day, we are all on the same team. We are all still part of the same community. And you, I have seen so many companies and people just come and go, they start something, it That's doesn't true. work. They get in a fight with everybody. They, you know, save things they regret. And then when they want to yeah. try their next idea, nobody wants to work with them because they were complete jerks. And at yeah. the end of the day, Day, we're all working towards the same goal. We're all taking many different ways of going about that. But if we're not united as, as a community, it's going to be that much harder to accomplish these big picture things we're all setting out to do. So keep going and be kind to each other. So true. Great advice, Perianne. Um, if people are interested to learn more about the chamber, how do they get in touch with you? And if people would like to reach out to you personally, how best can they do that? You can uh, see us on our website at digitalchamber.org and you can ping me on Twitter at Perianne DC. Awesome. Thanks again for joining us. It was yeah, great to see you. you. What does it take to connect billions of people, to transcend borders and rewrite the system to be more fair, just, and free for all? 
It takes a willingness to challenge old principles and create a new foundation that forever changes the way we transact and interact because financial freedom belongs to everyone. Over the past three years, you've watched us grow from a cryptocurrency exchange to a comprehensive blockchain ecosystem to build today's crypto world and the crypto universe of tomorrow. We were never alone because from day one, we've been working and growing together in support of a shared vision to increase the freedom of money for all, the freedom to earn, the freedom to hold, the freedom to spend, share, and give. No matter who you are or where you come from, it takes a community to change the world. Though we still have a long way to go, let's take these next steps together. Because together, we'll unlock the freedom to do more. Whoa, I love this edition. And it's great Me to look too. back on how much we've accomplished in this last three years, right, Leah? That video is so good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you again to Tina and Perianne too for the latest on the regulatory side. Um, switching gears a little bit, next up we'll be diving into blockchain on the global stage with a panel on scalability and blockchain development. On this session, we will have Benjamin Minsu from Elrond, Nick White from Harmony, Mo Dong from Seller Network, Terry Wang from IOST, and this will be moderated by Lucas Nitsi from Coinmetric. And in parallel, on the local stage, I invite a Spanish panel about how hyperinflation turned Venezuela in a case study of crypto with unique and different opportunities. Uh, this is an amazing panel. It's going to be held all in Spanish, and we're going to have a chat with Jorge Farias from Crypto Buyer. Uh, also, Ernesto Contreras from Dash, Aaron Olmos from Almost Group Venezuela, and Maria Angel from Binance will be our moderator. So if you are watching on Binance.com, you can easily jump from the global stage to the local stage, and then you can watch this quite interesting panel. And after these sessions, we are pretty excited to have Michael Gu, also known as Box Mining, moderating a panel on security, managing the keys to crypto success with Victor Radchenko, CEO of Trust Wallet, Veronica Wong, CEO of SafePal, Matt Marks, co-founder of Fishport, and Constantine Gladich, CEO of Atomic Wallet. Please enjoy. Thanks, Myra, and thanks, Leah. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to the Scalability in Blockchain Development panel. Uh, my name is Lucas Nutzi. I am the Network Data Product Manager at Coinmetrics. And since 2013, I've been building infrastructure for crypto assets, as well as producing uh, cross-sectional research on various technologies. And blockchain scalability has certainly been a recurring topic of my research. And it's perhaps one of the biggest challenges faced by our industry today. So to discuss this topic, I am joined by a great panel of co-founders that are trying to address the issue of blockchain scalability. So perhaps to kick things off, um, how about we start with brief introductions uh, of each one of our panelists and perhaps a short description of your projects. Maybe start with you, Nick. Sure, I'm happy to start. Well, thanks, Lucas. Uh, and thanks, Binance, for hosting this event. It's really exciting to talk about scalability because it's something that Harmony is very passionate about. Um, Harmony is a uh, layer one protocol that uses proof of stake and sharding to create a much faster, more scalable, lower cost blockchain protocol for people to build decentralized applications. Um, we started in 2018 we did an IEO on Binance in 2019. And just this past May, we launched our mainnet, which has four shards and features proof of stake. So we're one of the first uh, sharded proof of stake networks to ever go live. And we think there's a tremendous opportunity right now with the emergence of decentralized finance and a lot of really exciting use cases where scalability and gas costs are becoming a problem. So I think it's a very uh, apt time for us to be talking about this. Uh, and Harmony is really taking a stand as one of the, the foremost 
uh, scalable blockchain protocols. Who wants to go next? All right, I, I guess I can go next. Uh, uh, hi everyone, Mo from Setter. Uh, we are a layer two uh, scaling platform uh, that built on existing blockchains like Ethereum, like any EVM supported blockchains. And our mission here is to bring extremely high interactive and real time user interaction to blockchain that is familiar by the people who are using today's normal non-blockchain applications. We're bridging the gap of user experience here basically. So we launched the world first uh, generalized uh, state channel network mainnet uh, last year, and we just run a uh, you know major mainnet upgrade last May, and uh, we're seeing people expanding that network very quickly. And we're also very interested in the application, especially on the mass adoption side of a blockchain uh, application. And uh, we have uh, uh, also released uh, the world first ever uh, real money esport uh, application on App Store that can use cryptocurrency, but the user has no feeling they're actually interacting with the blockchain uh, directly. And uh, you know, recently we have been also stepping into uh, the layer two rollup space, and uh, you know, focusing on some new technology and exciting development on hybrid rollup uh, that are proposed by us that we can talk about. Yep. Hello, guys. Um, this is Benjamin Minku. I'm uh, founder and CEO of Belrond. Um, really great to be here and have this conversation. Elrond is basically the platform that I think will take blockchain from the current state it is right now, where we have something like 50 million people from around the world um, playing with this technology to um, a billion people, uh, where people not only have a really scalable architecture, um, meaning one that is high bandwidth, low latency, high security, and low cost, but then we've also put a lot lot of time into solving the user experience problem. And we think that by addressing two, these two critical problems, um, we will essentially escape this um, narrow crypto niche that we currently have right now and make blockchain usable for anyone in the world by making it invisible. So I'm really excited to be here and have this conversation. Uh, I guess it's my turn. So, hi guys, this is Terry. Uh, it's 2 a.m. in morning in the <laughs> in Beijing right now. So, really glad to join the Binance third year anniversary. So, I'm the co-founder and CTO of IOST. And IOST is a third generation blockchain designed for decentralized applications. So, according to DApp Radar and some of the uh, ranking DApp websites. So right now we are the top four, uh, the <clears throat> top four DApp platform in the world. So right now LSD is hosting about 80 decentralized applications, uh, ranging from DeFi and education tools and games and so on. So we are also focusing on building uh, enterprise level and uh, government platforms for blockchain applications. So we have already collaborated with uh, the third largest power generation platform in Japan. And we recently announced the collaboration with the Chinese National uh, NAA, so the National Archive Administration in China. So I believe that's probably one of the highest level government's uh, <clears throat> collaboration in the blockchain field. And our goal is to bring more blockchain applications uh, for enterprises and for customers. So very excited to be here. And yeah, so that's IST. <clears throat> Fantastic. And thank you for joining us this late uh, for you. And I imagine others are joining us in uh, inconvenient timelines, but uh, this is exciting enough to, to bring people, people in. So. To formalize this problem, you know, it's, it, scalability is not a new problem, right? It's been a recurring topic of research amongst high profile researchers in this industry, you know, dating back to 2014. Um, so I think Vitalik Buterin was the first one to kind of formalize the problems around uh, building scalable blockchains with the scalability trilemma, right? It's the, it's the idea that blockchains can have at most two out of three key properties 
So one, of course, the scalability, the ability to process thousands of transactions at every second and onboard potentially millions or billions of users. Uh, the second one is security, right? Providing strong assurances on economic finality, you know, the, the assurances that transactions will be final and in a timely manner. And then the third one is decentralization. So how independent is uh, each of the validating nodes in a network uh, so that it prevents you know, systems that rely on oligarchies and um, you know, some pervasive governance systems. From you guys' perspective, uh, you know, four years after the scalability trilemma has been introduced, do you think it's still valid given um, how far the industry has come along in terms of research? And do you agree with uh, the, the formalization of the problem? Uh, are there additional issues that you see uh, or challenges that you see with scalable blockchains? I, I would um, go first and, and try to address um, this idea, which is called the scalability trilemma. And interestingly enough, I would say that this trilemma applies very much to Ethereum and to the projects that came uh, before Ethereum. But essentially, it does not necessarily apply to new architectures that can solve this problem from a higher level standpoint. Uh, meaning that if you reason from first principles, there is no particular reason why you should not be able to solve this problem of not only scalability, but um, also security and decentralization in a very, very compelling and elegant way. Um, interestingly enough, um, in an interview um, not long ago, I think Vitalik mentioned that as he built Ethereum, he was very much aware that it would not scale. And in his mind, um, this was very much a kind of limitation that they were not able to address at that time. We are in a very different period um, right now. And um, during this year, I believe that everything in the blockchain space will change just because of especially two important elements. The first one is this transition from dial-up to broadband that we saw in the early internet era and will very likely see in the blockchain space. Elrond is, is one of the projects that is trying to show that you can process more than 10,000 transactions per second right now, uh, not in two or three years, right now with a five seconds latency and the 100x lower cost than uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum. And then obviously the second problem beyond the scalability problem will be um, this very, very difficult user experience problem that is sort of like an elephant in the room after you solve scalability. So um, I, I think it will be probably the most exciting time to, to look at the blockchain space. And for people that have not yet entered, um, this is the time where they want to start doing the research, engaging with the project. And um, if they can build stuff or can get involved, it will likely um, be very, very much worth it. So uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the for the great uh, note there. And just to kind of add on to that topic a little bit more. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the, the topic of a, a scalability trilemma was defined within a certain solution space, if you may. So basically, uh, when the so we, we talked about decentralization, security, and the scalability cannot be achieved at the same time. But under what condition? Like the the assumption back then was that okay, we have this blockchain that every computer and storage is running on the same exact blockchain and every node in this uh, uh, system has to reach consensus in a way in terms of both compute and storage at the exact same time. And for, for that kind of construct, it is very hard to reach these three properties all together at the same time. But things have changed a lot in the sense that we open up the solution space a lot. Like basically, we're not only just saying that, okay, we need to have storage and computer scalability at the exact same time. We can actually separate that. We can actually introduce a one layer of indirection. It's always said that in computer science, if you cannot solve a problem, you just introduce another layer of indirection and you will be able to solve that problem. 
And that's kind of like the promises of uh, um, some of the uh, sharding solutions and also for layer two uh, at, uh, at, at a certain extent. That is, we're leveling up and separating these more nuanced the different parameters to create a new uh, solution spaces. So like, for example, uh, in uh, Satter's hybrid rollup, we're trading off a, li a little bit more of the storage scalability, but we're gaining a lot more uh, on the computer side. Basically, if you have a more uh, scalability on the storage side in terms of like blockchain's uh, uh, call data storage, uh, then what you can actually get is a huge amount of computer power that uh, reside actually in layer two. And then later on, if there is any security issues, it can still be challenged back into the blockchain to the slower path. So like this kind of a separation start to uh, explode in the blockchain technology uh, environment. So it becomes a, a much more nuanced uh, uh, you know, solution space than the initial uh, topic we were being, uh, we have been discussing about like, okay, we have this flat blockchain and these are three properties that we cannot achieve at the same time. Uh, I think that that narrative has passed and has evolved so much after uh, that period of time. I, I'd love to add a little color too from Harmony's perspective. Um, and it kind of builds off of what Benjamin and, and Mo were saying. Um, first of all, I just want to talk about two of the main components of our architecture that we feel solve scalability. Um, and, and I also want to talk more about what is scalability. And to me, scalability is not just throughput. It also has to do with the cost of the transaction and also the, the fast, how fast can you confirm a transaction? Um, and so on those last two points, proof of stake is actually a really large, a huge innovation that allows us to have finality in, in Harmony's case in, in eight seconds. And it also allows us to reduce the cost of running the blockchain and therefore reduces the cost of using it. Um, so that's a big one. But Sharding, obviously, is kind of what um, Mo and, and Benjamin were, were mentioning. I think sharding is the one that does, in some sense, solve the scalability trilemma. It allows you to parallelize blockchain transactions and storage to split them up. But just like Mo said, it actually, in some sense, pushes a problem, sort of kicks the can down the road slightly, in that sharding introduces its own problems just as it solves others. And those problems are that uh, it, it challenges composability, which is a big feature in Ethereum, especially for uh, use cases like decentralized finance. When you have a sharded blockchain, uh, um, smart contracts can't necessarily be composable in the same way. Um, and also the, the whole issue around uh, data availability. So I think what I'm trying to say is that sharding is a solution, but it introduces more problems. And those are problems that still have yet to be solved um, and so it, it'll be interesting. I, I don't think that the problem is over. I think it will be constantly trying to improve uh, blockchain architecture, um, kind of like Benjamin said, from uh, dial up to broadband and there's, then there's gonna be 5G. So we're uh, at Harmony really excited about continuing to pursue the latest innovations. And it, it's kind of gonna be a never ending quest, I think. Yeah, that's great. And I myself used to be uh, very skeptical of the solutions back then when this was introduced, because I think at the time it really encompassed the state of research around these systems. Uh, and this, you know, precedes sharding, it precedes, you know, the viralization of layer two approaches. Uh, and, you know, more recently, it seems like a lot of these uh, issues have been addressed and we have at least a roadmap to get to a potential solution. Whereas before, there wasn't much clarity on how each one of these individual axioms would be uh, resolved. But at the same time, it seems like the projects that are pursuing this are somewhat siloed. And uh, it, it seems like scalability has been solved, but it's, it's also spread out into various different projects. Uh, uh, do, you, do you guys see that as uh, something that um, is a potential challenge for your project specifically, you know, because not only you're having to scale, but you're having to scale and build a community that already exists and might not be fully aware of the intrinsics um, of each one of those individual systems. Uh, are there trade-offs to be considered? Uh, is it a situation where it, it, it really has to be built from the ground up again 
um, to be successful in, in onboarding users and, and growing exponentially. I, I would um, touch on this and uh, say that this is basically how things uh, naturally evolve. Uh, you essentially cannot create or build a new technology and expect to have the community already or to have everything built around the, the ecosystem of the project. Rather, if you look at how things have evolved, Bitcoin, interestingly enough, was not understood by the bankers or financiers of the time. Um, and it was very much even rejected by the technical people. Um, many of the people that um, were initially attracted to Bitcoin were cypherpunks, uh, were people that understood some very, very interesting ideas and then were attracted to this thing that looked almost like a toy and they wanted to explore what it could do. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at Ethereum, Ethereum did not take off within the Bitcoin community. In fact, the Bitcoin community uh, was full of maximalists that became sort of fundamentalists on, on different aspects and could not see what Ethereum was doing. And then Ethereum found a different community among the developers. Um, I, I would say that any project that is trying to replicate purely replicate the Ethereum model um, will not be able to win because there's already an Ethereum out there. Um, so we not only need to understand that this was the case with Bitcoin and Ethereum, but naturally it will be the case for the new projects coming out also. So given this fact, um, I, I believe it will be extremely interesting to see how the projects position themselves, what the communities around the projects look like, how the projects become rele relevant in those communities, and most importantly, um, what I think specifically about Elrond is that if you look at the blockchain space and where it is right now, um, there's this really obvious question that most of the projects and most of the people do, do, do not ask, which is, it's nice that we have a few million, tens of millions of people that are a part of the space, that are trading, that are trying to build different things. But why, why are we looking only inside the current community? Why are there not very, very significant efforts put in to escape this group of people? Because there are 8 billion people out there. And if we can address this, if we can not only have a network that can be uh, or work at the internet scale, but then also um, offer a user experience, like I said, where you don't have to learn rocket science, but the people can really use uh, the features of the blockchain um, as being invisible. At that point, I think you're finally going to see the promise of the blockchain technology fulfilled in a way that um, we've not seen before. And, and this is actually the really great promise that excites us very, very much at Elon and that we're pushing for. Fantastic. Yeah. So for the sake of time, we're, we're approaching the end here. Uh, perhaps each one of you guys could tell us uh, what is the upcoming um, updates for each one of these projects. What are you guys working on? And perhaps uh, end by um, saying how, you, how people can get in touch, how people can learn more about your projects uh, and some resources that they could uh, search online. Well, uh, I can start. starting with so, you, Mel? Yeah, yeah uh, we have been pushing uh, not only on the technology front, but also pretty heavily on the consumer side. Uh, and we're just exactly as uh, 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 ben said, like uh, we're jumping out of the circle, and uh, we are uh, we are pushing a very major release up, uh, update for uh, the application that we're building called Arcade Wing, and that is kind of accumulating from all sides a, a large amount of users and converting them gradually to blockchain users. Uh, so you can always follow us at Saturday Network and uh, our Telegram groups. Great. Uh, um, people can find us at Harmony One. We have a very active Telegram community. So I encourage people to go there if they want to learn more. We are on Twitter at Harmony Protocol. Uh, and some of the big updates we have coming up 
Um, we just launched our grants program last month and we have our first batch of grantees. So you can see that, uh, who, who we're funding. And if you're interested to build with Harmony uh, and experience what it's like to have an extremely low cost and fast finality blockchain, um, we encourage you to get in touch. Uh, we'd love to build with you. So um, we have about $7 million worth of grant funding. So um, yeah, please come to us and we'd love to work together. See you all guys are frozen. Uh, so you can just follow IOST on the official Twitter. So it's at IOST underscore official. And uh, you can also follow us in the Reddit and our mainnet. Okay, so our we got a big milestone coming and you probably can see this all over the place in this month. And also uh, we got a two of the, the DeFi protocols and some of the very large uh, corporation and partnerships coming out. So you can see, I see more of the applications we're running out.